Amen. How many know? Uh, yeah, put your hands together. <clears throat> relationships are work. I said relationships are work. How many of y'all married in here? <laughs> we talked about that last week. There's work involved if you want that relationship to remain healthy. And um, I was uh, eating with uh, uh, Doc and Candace. How many years is it you guys been married? Forty? Forty-six? Glory to God, I tell you. Has it, has it all been easy? <laughs> See, now you need to repent for lying. So, <laughs> so last week we talked about that. If you weren't here Sunday, shame on you. No, if you weren't here Sunday, you should, get the, you should really get the message. Because uh, I, I think I, I really kind of covered some real practical things about relationships and I tell you, I preach myself happy. I think there were some little nugs there that if any of us would just apply them to our our lives and, and not just be hearers of the word, but doers, then I believe that we can start seeing uh, victory in our relationships. Amen? Amen? Wasn't it good to be in the house of God? Amen. Come on, isn't it good? Yeah. I like our little uh, Thursday group, and um, it's growing. There was a couple times I thought maybe we might, I mean Thursday, Wednesday, we might put Wednesday on hold. Uh, Thursday's coming. We're going to have youth night on Thursday. How many of y'all are excited about that? How many of y'all want to get involved in that? See, everybody's quiet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll put Sierra to work. We're going to need help for that. And uh, by the grace of God, Pastor will be able to continue. <laughs> y'all pray for me. I haven't ministered to teenagers in years. They change. They're creatures. You know what I'm saying? I mean, seriously, come on. Can I get a witness in here? Anybody got some teenagers? Man. <laughs> Them jokers are like one way, one year, 14, 15. They're totally somebody else. Come on. <laughs> 16, I don't even know who you are. What you talking about? <laughs> I tell you, they know more than you at 15 nowadays, huh? Mm-mm-mm. Hard head makes a soft behind. That's what daddy used to tell me. <clears throat> but I am excited. I'm going to have, uh, I'm gonna have a homeboy of mine from back in Titusville who, I tell you, this guy has got a testimony. Uh, he, uh, he went to the federal penitentiary for manufacturing and selling crack cocaine. I think he got caught with a couple quarter kilos and uh, did, did a bunch of time and just a thug dude was just really uh, out there in the streets and anyway the Lord put me and him together and uh, I was able to baptize him last year and uh, he he was always gifted uh, in uh, hip-hop music and rap and he made music then to glorify the devil but now he makes music to glorify Jesus and uh, they, they've got a, they put out their first album God Squad it's really hot it's got a bunch of tracks pastor kevin's on one of them preaching in the background and stuff but anyway we're going to try to get him here um for the 15th or the 16th what's that friday night the 16th of november to kind of kick this thing off and so i think it's going to be awesome we're going to try to pack this place out get some young people here and have him come and minister uh in song and maybe he'll share his testimony and it'll just be a powerful night and we'll get some pizza come on amen because uh, we have to eat everything with Grace City. Anytime we have any function, it's got to be some kind of beverage, food, or d'oeuvre, something. Come on. Amen. A kind of age group. So uh, he just wants to come for the pizza. Amen. So he's not even, is he? I know. He's not a teenager. He's a teenager over and over, he said. So. That'll work. Praise God. Well, how many of y'all ready to hear the Word of God tonight? Amen? Amen. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to do my best. I think if I do that, we'll all walk out of here all right. Amen? Rhonda, you looking at me? Is that the best? My best not good enough? <laughs> you were looking. <laughs> you were looking. <laughs> uh, we've been studying through the book of Acts, and um I've kind of sh shifted gears. Did I say that right? Sh sh shifted gears? Shifted, shifted. 
I'm, I'm shifting gears right now. We were going a verse-by-verse verse study, and we may get back on that, but I've kind of compartmentalized last couple messages. It's kind of been more topical, maybe because I just don't want to be put in a box. Come on, somebody. I just, don't put me in a box. So... I, I like, I rebel against myself, you know what I'm saying? I, is anybody with me tonight? I say, I'm going to do it one way, and then I start doing it. I'm like, I'm not doing it like that no more. <laughs> I'm going, you're not training me, Sean. I'm going this way. So uh, I, I've kind of been topical a little bit uh, lately, but it's been good. Amen. Y'all been blessed. And, um, and so it, it's been good. But we've been talking about, uh, really, we, we named the, the study through the book of Acts um, One Church. And I think that I could just stop and preach right there. Man, one church. You know, I was telling somebody, it might have been Dave. uh, If y'all haven't met Dave, Dave and, uh, is it Michael? Brian, I'm sorry. You got to listen. There's people been in the church a year, and I still don't know their name. So please don't be offended by that. But uh, (laughs) I'm like, Tara, who's that again? But uh, I was talking with you guys last last weekend or this past weekend, and... um, I said, you know, years ago, I was sharing this with Pastor Mike as well. You know, years ago, man, I would, I would be so dogmatic about doctrine. I literally would argue with people. I'd, I would get on Facebook, and I was a pastor, you know, and I'd go back and forth with people about stuff, you know. And, um, you know, a lot of times I was right in what I was saying. I'm not going to say every time I was right because, you know, I think Revelation's progressive. Come on, Amen. I think we're all endeavoring to, to, to grow. I think it's a progressive revelation about the kingdom, a progressive revelation about the things of God, the gifts of, of God, the gifts of the Spirit, things like that. But where I was in my life at that point, I felt like, you know, I was right on <laughs> the money. And, you know, I would get into these, in these conversations with people, and, you know, it would cause a lot of strife because I realized that people are hedged in. Does anybody know what that means? They're hedged in in their thinking, and I don't care. You're not going to crack that safe. You know what I'm saying? That's the way they've been taught. That's the way they believe. It don't matter. Jesus himself could come and preach a different message, bless God, and they are going home with what they know to be true about the Word of God and the things of God. And, you know, I just realized that you're not going to change some people's opinion. You're not going to change some people's theology. You're not going to change some people's, you know, ideas and their philosophies about what they perceive God to be and what they believe God is about and what, how they believe God responds to man and so forth and so on. But I was sharing with uh, my new friend David, I was saying, and, and Kevin, I said, I'm at a place now that I refuse to be in strife and not to be in unity with people because they don't believe like I believe. I just refuse. I'm to the point now, and I had a friend call me, and it was a real uh, testing point for me. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and he called me, and um, he had made a post about a church here in town. And, of course, I wouldn't say their name because it wouldn't do anybody any service, and it wouldn't be right. But, anyway, this church in town is putting on this event, and... Um, he has been really offended about the system, and he felt like it was glorifying the leaders and glorifying other things other than Jesus. And he wrote this blog about what he felt about this situation. And, you know, and, I, and he opened himself up a huge. I mean, when he posted that thing, it was like, I mean, it was like 19 comments in 30 seconds. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And, I mean, you talking about some believers just, you saw some different sides. I mean, it was like a lynching. You'd have thought for sure they was coming to his house to torch the place, drag him out, crucify him upside down. Y'all follow me? And uh, so he calls me and he says, he said, hey, pastor, he said, do you mind looking at that and telling me, you know, what you think about it? And so I read what he said. And there wasn't, I agreed with what he said, but what I've posted it where I'm at in in my walk with God, no, I wouldn't have posted it because nothing was going to come out of that edifying but, but here was the thing. There were some people that commented on it. And I love how people take scriptures randomly out of nowhere and try to apply them to a point they're making to try to put somebody else down. Is anybody with me? I mean, it's just amazing to me the scriptures that people will pull out and try to force them and twist them and malign them and make a point that has nothing to do with it. And it was so funny that one person chose to do that out of the book of Galatians. 
Y'all didn't catch that. We've been studying through. If pastor hasn't gotten any revelation these last few months, it's about the book of Galatians. And, and the text that they chose had nothing to do. It was talking about uh, one leaving and uh, turning from the grace of God and trying to perform in a system of works. And they just maligned this thing and twisted it. And um, I was so bad, I was itching. I was like, I just want to say, I don't have anything to do with this dog. I don't have a dog in this fight, but... That, that scripture's out of context. I just want to let you know right now, that has nothing to do with the argument. <laughs> I was like, have y'all ever been there? You're on Facebook and you just, I typed out an email to somebody the other day and, and um, I thought that this person was kind of treating me a little different and, and we had a relationship business-wise. And um, I told my wife, I said, I was telling her and she didn't get a chance to read it yet. And I typed this whole thing out, you know? I was like, are you offended at me? Because if you are, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Da, da, da. And I was about to nuke, hit the send button. You know, I was about to hit the nuke button. And, and the Holy Spirit said, don't do it. I was like, I just typed this thing out. I made sure it was grammarly, you know, right. And I don't even do that. I put you and R in my text, you know. I did this thing really professional, Lord. You're not going to let me send this. But I knew it would have caused more problem. It would have caused more hurt. And so I hit the delete button. Y'all ever do that? And I just wrote something else and hit send. What I'm saying is it's more important to me now in this, this place and where I'm at to walk in unity. We need to ask ourselves every day, is what I'm going to say, is what I'm going to do, or the things that, I'm believing going to bring us closer together or is it going to divide? That's simply the question. And one of the things that we see is a major theme in the book of Acts. Too many meatballs. Can y'all tell? Um, is who brought the meatballs? They were amazing. Uh, by the way, I need some for tomorrow night. Um, but there was a theme and the theme was they walked in unity. They walked with one accord to such a degree that it literally shook the heavens. That when the book of Acts was written in the apostles, of, of, of the Acts of the Apostles, man, there is unprecedented things that took place because of the spirit of unity. Because people were so focused on the one mission, and that was to declare who Jesus Christ was in the earth. And I want to tell you today that if we'll get back to the principles, and that's why I said I really put Grace City as a model of the early church. What I'm saying is I really believe that we're trying to model. Now, obviously, we didn't live in that culture and that time, and things are different, and I understand that. I get that. But the principles should remain. Come on. Amen? The principles should remain, as Pastor Mike was sharing, about things that we should be able to go to our brother and sister if we're offended. Come on. I mean, if we're really mature believers, shouldn't we be able to go to that person in private and say, have I offended you? Am I, are you hurt? Are you mad at me? Things like that. Without going to 10 people and sounding off and asking them what they think about it and causing so much strife before you go to that person and then the whole thing is blown up. Everybody's hurt. Everybody's, you know, gossiping and backbiting and destroying what God has put together as being a body in him be in the head we've got to stop we've got to stop doing these things and these are the principles that I I believe that makes us a different church doesn't mean we're a perfect church doesn't mean that there's not other churches in our city and other churches globally that operate that way but I believe that I teach from the pulpit and try to live as an example that we will model the early church because when you begin to model the things that we're talking about in the book of Acts, there's power. There's great power. There's ability. Why do you think we're seeing God move and people being healed and things like that? Because we are moving in power. We're moving with knowledge about who Jesus is and that our mind is, is focused on we want to exalt Jesus. We just want to bring glory to the king. Come on. 
We just really want to see Jesus glorified in this place. We want to see Jesus exalted in our midst. And so when, when a body of believers begins to, to dial in and tune in to such a degree that all we want to do is see Jesus glorified, things begin to happen. Things begin to, to manifest from the supernatural into the natural. It's not just something that you heard about. It's not just something that, you know, you, you, you think could happen. It becomes reality. It takes what seems to be hope and brings it in to a reality. And you begin to see that thing before your very eyes. But it takes a body of people walking in one accord. Let me tell you, the quickest thing to destroy the miracle working power of God is a bunch of people that are in discord. You want to blow shop and blow wreck? Get a bunch of people together who's backbiting, gossiping, talking, running one another down, grumbling, complaining, murmuring. You want to just quench the spirit in a church and really kill what God's doing. Have a bunch of Jezebel, spirited people running around, talking about everybody and just running everybody down. And you can see something that God intended to be glorious and started to move in and see it just completely shut down. That's why it's so important, each one of us. This ain't even what I was preaching. I promise you, this ain't even in my notes. But I believe that this is something we need to hear. And I know, and here's, here's what I do know. I do know this. I know a lot of times it's not malicious. I really, I really believe. I, I know there are people in the body of Christ that are just malicious. They just want to tear people down. They just want to put people. They always find something critical about their brother or sister. It's not about the 20 things they're doing good. Come on. It's about the two or three things that they're not quite there yet. And so they focus on that and they begin to tear that person down or those people down in the things that, you know, they don't believe that they have arrived yet. But there are those people that really don't mean it, but they don't realize the harm they're doing. They don't realize the things that they say have consequences. It sets, it sets a precedent for other people to begin to model and it begins to rot it's like a cancer it begins to eat away and it begins to jump from person to person like a contagious ravenous disease and before you know it everybody's filled with it and if we would ever get to the place that we just had such a just one thing we will not put up with is anything that's going to come against and hurt another believer, another family member, I tell you, we could see the greatest move of God ever. But it's so easy, isn't it, when things aren't going right? Isn't it easy just to find those things about somebody? And oftentimes I think it's really the issues that we have in ourselves that we're so easily to pick out in other people. I know I've been guilty. Things like, you know, procrastination. I, I like to pick that out in other people because I procrastinate a lot as a pastor. And I find myself doing it. It's so amazing how we're so quick to be, criticized, to be critical towards somebody else. And it's this very thing that you're dealing with that you're easily able to pick out in somebody else. Am I preaching good tonight? This isn't one of them hallelujah, shout me down messages, is it? Huh? Y'all don't turn me off. We're just going to open up the altars right now. Does anybody need to repent and just come down here and get on their face? These are things. Now, I'm not saying the early church was perfect. Obviously, as we got into the text, we've seen there were some things. We just was in chapter 5. In chapter 5, we see that there was, a di there was a big disturbance over the distribution of food. And, you know, the Hellenist and, and, you know, the Greek, basically to break it down in real layman's terms, the Greek widows and the Hebrew widows were getting differential treatment. You know, they were coming to them and saying, you know, what are we going to do? They're getting more food. They're getting more meatball subs. Come on. They're getting more uh, pizza. And we want to know what you're going to do about this. And so we see that there's problems. We saw that there, there was problems when they came and they laid the, 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 the monies and the, the, the different things down at the apostles' feet. And we've seen that some kept back. There, there wasn't a perfect church. But if you would just look at the common denominator, the theme throughout the book of Acts, I, I would dare to say that it's one word. It was unity. 
that they had one assignment, and that was to declare Jesus was Lord. And they did that through miracle signs and wonders, may I add. They declared who he was by allowing the Holy Spirit to minister in and through them, and they literally shook the world and changed what we call today, you know, uh, the foundations of our faith. Twelve people. It's amazing what 12 people could do. How many of you think we got here tonight? Maybe 30? I don't know. 35 maybe? What could we do as a body of believers if we begin to stop people in a loving way and say, hey, brother, I understand you're upset with so-and-so. Have you went to that person? Have you talked to that person? Have you, you know, have you went over and expressed how you feel, you know, and told them that the very thing that they're doing is hurting you? I'm just picking on Michael. He hasn't hurt nobody. Not that I know of. But, you know, if we've went and started to do those things and cut out, let me tell you what James says. He says, where envy and strife is, there's every evil work. I knew for years when me and Tara, and I'll just be transparent, Tara's probably going to get mad at me later, so y'all pray for Pastor. I know for years when we started early on in our relationship in the Lord, you know, there was things that I just, you know, we would go to bed angry and we, would, we wouldn't resolve things and stuff like that. And I would be real prideful about things because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but men, uh, you oftentimes and your, wimp and your wives are not on the same place spiritually. And, and let me just say this. Maybe your wives um, and you aren't spiritually. Maybe your wives are a little bit more in the Lord than you. But, there's, <laughs> but there, you, you, you knew better to say that, didn't you, Doc? But, <laughs> but there's times that you're, you're different places. And may I add, there's different callings in your life, Right? There's a different call. I have a call to preach the word. My wife doesn't. She's very reserved. That doesn't mean she doesn't love God, that she doesn't have a vibrant relationship with God. But she was created differently, and she was created to be my helpmate and help me do what I do. And I could not do what I do without who she is in my life. Couldn't do it. God knows he suited me with her because she is probably one of the most unselfish people when it comes to me doing. I'm embarrassing her. I'm definitely going to get get this later on but she is one of the most unselfish people when it comes to what I do what I do she never says anything about me going out late going to hospitals ministering uh, putting them off at times because of other people's problems and things like that but uh, early on in our life in our in our walk with God you know there was times that we would have unresolved issues and you know I would just be prideful and wouldn't want to you know resolve those issues and we'd go to bed and it, we'd wake up the same morning or whatever whatever happened but I started noticing something when this happened I started noticing that it opened the door to all kinds of other problems in my life is anybody hearing me I noticed that it sometimes uh, things like sickness, sometimes things like a uh, financial uh, debt or, or some type, I, I started really noticing that things were happening in our marriage because of this principle. Because where envy and strife is, there's every evil work. Where you open up the door to the enemy and give him a foothold, let me just say it this way, he'll kick it wide open, swing it, knock it off the hinges, come in and bring all his little hairy demons with him and just make a camp in your house. Come on. And I'm not even going to preach this message tonight, but I'm going to go with what I'm going with. He says where envy and strife is, is every evil work. Every evil or every foul spirit, every funky spirit, everything that would come against the plan of God, everything that would try to rob and steal and kill destinies and try to rob and steal plans and, and things that God has destined starts with the little things. Do you know it's the little foxes that spoil the vine church? Do you know it's the very little things that you seem to deem as something that's not really important is the very thing that gets in and robs you from everything that God would have. It's the little things that lead to bigger things. It was uh, smoke and pot for me that led me on to being a full-blown crack addict and robbing people at gunpoint. It was smoking marijuana at 15, 16 years old. See, the devil never plays the tape through. See, he doesn't show the whole tape. 
He doesn't show kids when they're teenagers drinking the Michelob light, you know, and they're all hanging out on the boat and stuff. He don't show them wrapped around the car and their friend catapulted through the windshield, severed almost in half. They don't show that. They don't show the promiscuous commercials, you know, with the, with the sexy lingerie and all that, and they're all getting ready to, to do the scene later on with that person withered. Have you ever seen anybody die from AIDS? I want to tell you it's a horrible sight. They're withered up and their bones are showing and they've got sores all over them and it's, there's a foul stench in the room and, and they're just completely decomposing. He doesn't show that when he's showing all the sexual innuendos, does he? Why? Because it's the little things. It's the things that we don't put in check. It's the little things, the little heart checks. I was talking today in school, and I'll just preach this another time. Is y'all all all right with that? I was talking today in school, and, um, you know, I was talking about a a physical checkup. You know, it wasn't too long ago that I went to the doctor. Well, I say it was too long. It was several years ago. And I had to do some... And I had to do... That's good, right? Yeah, praise God. And so, um, anyway, I had to go to this checkup. It was kind of embarrassing. They were asking me to do some weird stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, filling on you every kind of place and telling you to do all these things. But one of the things was he was telling me to bend over, do this, do that. And I was kind of worried about the bending over part. I was watching him. And, um, well, I had a bad experience one time before with that. That's another message. (laughs) But, uh... (laughs) But, come on. But while, you know, it's amazing how the Holy Ghost works. While I'm in there doing these calisthenics and bending over and and doing all these things and, you know, the Lord said, this is how we ought to be about spiritual. We ought to have a spiritual checkup. I said, wow, Lord, that's good. That'll preach, God. How much more should we have a spiritual checkup when we have... These little issues that we we don't that go unchecked, huh? That we don't deal with. You know? The little, you know, hurt my feelings and didn't talk to me today and what's wrong, you know, and all these little things and and, and they begin to they begin to fester, you know? They go unchecked, you know? You don't deal with them right then. What happens if you don't deal with a cut and you don't, you know, it gets infected, right? You know? Something I, I I remember one time I had a I had a hangnail or something, you know, and I, I just kept messing with it, messing with it, and I didn't deal. And that thing, I tell you, I was ready to cut my foot off. For, I mean, for the love of God, I mean, I've never had so much pain in my life, and it festered up. And I thought, how could this happen from a hangnail, you know? But what happened? Surfing every day, being a bum, not wearing shoes, you know. You know, I grew up without shoes in Titusville. You just, people lived on the coast, didn't wear shoes. And it's just like my feet, Tara met me. She said, people in Lake City wear shoes, honey, all right? It's scummy not to wear shoes here. And I was like, huh, I can't go in without my shoes and no shirt on. And, uh, but uh, where I grew up, you know, you went to the convenience stores, Walmart, barefooted, no shirt. I mean, true story. You come up here, it was like, you're low rent, white trash, if you don't wear shoes in Lake City. And my feet were hard as a rock. You know, I could f- kick through a brick wall from walking on the ground. But anyway, my point is this, that toe... That little deal of me just kind of having this hangnail, I mean, it turned into a big deal because I didn't deal with it. It's the same thing in the life of the believer, the little things that we don't deal with. That's why it's so important. Paul said it this way. He said that I, I make sure that I have a clear conscience before God and before men. What a radical statement the Apostle Paul is making. He said it's important not only that our conscience is clear before God, but before men. What does that mean? Then he says, he goes on to say that we live as peaceably as possible with all men. Wow. That means we have a part. See, I think oftentimes we think, well, I ain't done nothing, so I ain't going to do it. You know, that's on them. No, that's not what the scriptures teach. It's not, oh, okay, they're going to deal with it. They're going to have to get over it. No, we have a response. Now, I'm talking about the family of God. Listen to me. I'm talking about especially in the household of faith. How much more should we try to 
deal with that hangnail before it turns into your foot being amputated and turns into lives being shattered and things being broken and trust being misplaced. I don't know about you, but that's a hurtful thing when trust is misplaced. When you trust somebody and you confide in somebody. Has anybody ever been, I have anybody that's ever been hurt in here? Come on. Where, you know, you trust somebody and you confide in somebody only for them to turn around and just stick it so deep off in your back. You know, my pastor told me this one time, uh, Pastor Terry, he said, Sean, uh, there's something that I want you to know. And he told me this a decade ago. That's probably longer than that. He said, you have never been hurt till somebody in the body of Christ hurts you. He said, you don't know what it's like until somebody that you've pastored, that you've wept over, that you, you know, done, done their weddings and their funerals and been at the hospital beds and done all these things. And these people turn on you and dig it off in you. He said, then you'll understand what hurt is. And you know what? I finally found out what that felt like. And man, I tell you what, he was right. He was right. There's something about when, when, when trust is misplaced and, and our confidence has been betrayed and, and people who we just know that we know that had, us, had love for us and had our best interest, and it's those very people that the next day, it's like reminds me of Jesus. He's coming through the city, and they're laying the palms down, and he's riding on the colt, and what are they saying? Hosanna in the highest, and it's the same people in the next chapter that's telling Pilate, crucify him. The same bunch. There's something wrong with that. I've been on the top of the, I've been the best thing since sliced bread. The church has been the greatest thing. And the next day I'm the low life, you know, sorriest thing. You know, this is the kind of model that we see a lot in the church today. I guess what I really want to challenge, I guess Mike got me started on this. And I feel like it's the Lord. We just need, we need to have a spiritual checkup every day. I just, I just challenge every one of us tonight. That we just take a, a moment, a reflection moment, and really begin to dig under the surface and, and really begin to get honest and say, Lord, is there things, Holy Spirit, reveal to me things in my life that are not pleasing to you. Things and attitudes and and, and, and mindsets and strongholds and things that I know that are contrary to the word of God and contrary to me ever reaching my place of destiny. Can I tell you that destiny is not by chance, it's by choice. You have to choose God's path. And let me tell you, the biggest hindrance and blocker is for you to allow things in your life to go unchecked. Because something that goes unchecked today, this time next year, is a disaster in your spiritual walk and hinders you from ever bearing fruit. I know we talk a lot about this, but God wants us to be fruitful. Wouldn't everybody agree with that? He wants us to display the fruit that he deposited on the inside of us. All nine of them, not just the ones you want to pick and choose. I operate in this, but I don't operate in that one, though. You know, it's like the spiritual gifts. I've got exclusively this one, you know. <laughs> I've got a little bit of joy, but I don't know about that self-control thing, all right? I'm still working on that thing. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still ready to punch people out on the interstate. Amen. Come on. Robert said amen. But see, if we'll begin to have a clear conscience before God and man, and we'll begin to allow the Holy Spirit to do a deep cleaning. It's ironic to me how spirit-filled believers have a four-bedroom house, right? This is just as an analogy. You got a four-bedroom house, and you got three of them that you say, Lord, you can have anything in there. Go on, go on, go on in there. Check the closet. But don't go in that back room. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, this one's good. This one's good, Lord. Oh, there's nothing in there you want to see. We've got that one room in our life that's closed off. That one closet door, you know? No, you don't want to go in there. There's nothing in there. But that's the very area that the Holy Spirit wants to get inside and 
wants to do a deep cleaning. He wants to begin to remove that stuff, those things in your life that are going unchecked, that are keeping you from reaching. Paul said, that we need to run the race that was set before us. And in fact, over in Hebrews, he said that we need to not become entangled again. And these besetting things that continue to haunt us and hold us, and it all starts because we're not willing just to release them and allow God every room in our house. Don't you just want to let God in every room tonight? And just say, Lord, you can have every room in my double wide. Come on. Since we live in North Florida, everybody's got double wide, right? Come on. <laughs> Lord, you can have every room in my triple wide. In the doghouse. You can even check my shed, Lord. But is this making sense tonight? I know it's not what I was going to preach, but I think, it, I think the Lord brought me here to say something tonight. I think that we just need to be real open and honest. That's why I'm so honest with you. You know, and I say this humbly, but I don't know a lot of pastors that share the things that I share. One thing is because they want to be the spiritual elite. They feel like if they're leading that they've got to be perfect. But you know what I find? Pastors in my life who are real honest and transparent, man, I get the most from. Because now I can identify with them. Now I can say, you know, one of the things about Joyce Meyer's ministry, I don't know if you guys like or dislike her. If you don't like her, don't share nothing in my church. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But, you know, one of the things about her, she is so transparent. I don't care if you're a guy, a girl, a boy, whatever, you can identify because she's so transparent about her life. You know, some of the things she shares, you know, I remember years ago... Tara used to get upset with me and I would share really, really just horrible details about my past, you know, about my testimony and the things I'd done. She's like, do you got to share everything? God. (laughs) And I'd say, Tara, it glorifies Jesus, but not only that, people can identify. I believe the way God uses me, I'm not the greatest theologian, won't never claim to be, I'm not a scholar. I'm just a man that loves the word of God and loves Jesus. I'm in love with a man, and his name is Jesus. But you know why I think God uses me? Because I'm not the third and fourth generation pastor. I didn't inherit this church from my granddaddy. You know, I'm the guy that was in the trenches. I'm the guy that's been through everything. We can go tit for tat for everybody in this room, and I promise you, you're never going to say anything to me that's going to shock me. Really? You did that? Wow. In fact, I'm probably going to be going, God, I'd hate to tell them some things. <laughs> if they think that's bad right now. Huh. I'm going to get Pastor Mike to counsel this one. Uh, I'm going to blow them away in a minute. But it's that transparency that brings things into reality. And see, a lot of what I'm preaching to you Wednesday to Sunday are things that I'm dealing with things that I still struggle with, things that I still have to put myself in check about, right? That's why I'm at a place to know that you're dealing with it. (laughs) Come on, huh? If I'm dealing with it, you're dealing. I'm pretty comfortable everybody in here is dealing with it on some level or another. Now, doesn't that make the situation a lot better? That you can come to a place in worship and you know that you don't have to feel condemned and judged and criticized and ridiculed about the things because every one of us is at different places in our life. But we have people that said, I've been there. I've got great leaders. I just heard this week about one of my leaders and some things that this person did. And, you know, I was driving home today and I was just thanking the Lord for that person. And you know what? This situation that they ministered in was totally just out of my league. And I knew that it was a God thing. And I, how I many know I don't, I don't, I'm not the best at everything. That's why I got people that God surrounds me with. I, and, I, you know, I think a lot of pastors feel like they have to do everything, you know. I've got to do this. I've got to do. No, all you've got to do is do what God's called you to do. Lead and then surround people around you that can help lead 
and reproduce leadership in everything that they do. And when you do that, everything just gels and works. And it's successful. And it's unified. But I was thinking about that, and I said, Lord, I'm just so blessed by the people that you've put in my life, that you allow me to continually build and, and help extend your kingdom. It's awesome. But you know what? Every person in my leadership can tell you that they can come in and we can get transparent in that office about anything, no matter what they're going through. And I can pretty much guarantee that there's probably not a person in the church, if they've known me long enough, that would feel any type of reservation of coming to me and saying, Pastor, I, I mean, I've got this thing going on. I'm struggling. I, I'm, and I, you know, that they wouldn't feel like they could just talk to me about it. That's the way the early church was. That was reality for them. They weren't the spiritual elite. They were the fishermen. They were the tax collector. They were the prostitute. Come on, somebody. They were the drug addict of today, the prostitute, you know, the pimp and, and, and the arm robber and all those people that society has deemed and said they're worthless, there's nothing we can use them. These are the very people that Jesus cultivated and grew up with and gave the church over to and entrusted the kingdom of God to, glory to God. This is what he turned the kingdom over to. That ought to just make you want to shout this morning or this afternoon. Huh? I don't even know if I'm on Sundays or Wednesdays. But that ought to just encourage you today. That he turned the kingdom over to Mary Magdalene and Matthew, the tax collector, and, you know, all these people that in their day and time and their culture said they're never going to be anything, they're never going to amount to nothing. They're just this or they're just that. They don't have enough education. They don't have enough this or that. They're not pretty enough. They're not smart enough. They're not strong enough. They, they've got mental problems, you know. They don't know how to budget money. All these things, Jesus said, but I don't see you where you are. I see what you can be. Huh? I see the completed version. Glory to God. Aren't you glad for that? Philippians 1.6 says, He that begin a good work will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. And so we should just relax and rest in assurance, knowing that if you're in Christ, and that you are in Christ and Christ is in you, that He's continuing that work in you. Now your part in this whole, this whole thing is to continue to yield every day to the Holy Ghost. How are you? Did you get on? Just every day you get out the way. Isn't that good? That's all you need to do is just get out the way. And just say, Lord, have your way today. In every situation, in every relationship, in everything that I'm going through today, Lord, you have your way. I want your plan for my life in this situation. I want your plan in this relationship. I want your plan on this, uh, you know, next opportunity. Whatever it is, I want your plan. For we know if we seek the plan of God, things are just going to work. But it's going to cause us to have to do an inventory. And I'm not talking about you going back 20 years and digging up stuff and listen to me. I'm not talking about getting spooky and kooky and confessing everything and listen to me. Don't leave out of here with that. That's not this, that's not this church. Where are you tonight? Would you stand with me? Where are you tonight? Where have you been this week where the Lord has just been tugging on you? You know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not a bad thing, you know? Maybe it's something that is good that God is wanting you to do. But you're letting it go unchecked. You know that reality is that the very people that God is asking you to minister to, their, their eternity hangs in the balance. And sometimes we go day after day, week after week, not obeying God, letting that thing fester and get bigger and bigger while someone's eternity is hanging in the balance. And we're simply not doing what God asked us to do. 
Maybe, maybe that's you tonight. Maybe there's a coworker or a friend or a family member, and, and the Holy Spirit has just been really prompting you and impressing you in such a way. Maybe it's a neighbor, and, you know, you go out there and get your garbage can. This, this is just, you know, I'm weird. I'm just, I see you guys going out and getting your garbage can, and, you know, and maybe the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about that, but you're, there's some kind of reservation or fear or rejection that you're afraid they're just not going to receive what you have to say, and so you let this thing go unchecked day after day, week after week, month after month. Maybe it's that. Or maybe you're here tonight and you just have some real bitterness towards somebody. Maybe you just have some stuff in your heart that you know it's God's been dealing with you and saying, you know, roll that thing over on me. Cast your cares, 1 Peter 5, on me because he cares for you. Maybe it's just one simple act of obedience that's going to open up a door for you to really, maybe you're in a place tonight and you're frustrated because you just doesn't, you, you really didn't see your life at this place in this season and you, you want to know what's going on next, but God has been asking you just to, just to open up this one door through one act of obedience and God is fixing to show you something in this season of your life, but you simply just won't open the door. You simply won't go through and do the very little thing that God is asking you to do. Maybe, that, maybe that's you tonight. But whatever it is, I just believe that in the next few minutes as we just go to the Lord, I, I believe that if we'll just do a spiritual checkup tonight and just keep our hearts before the Lord. I like what Charles Spurgeon said, and I'm going to close. He said that I want to set myself on fire before the Lord so that everyone could watch me burn. Man, isn't that awesome, Abel? He said, I want to set myself on fire. I want to get to such a place that I'm so vulnerable before the Lord. I know that's, that's a word that we don't like to talk about, that we, we don't want to be vulnerable in front of friends and coworkers. But what if tonight, church, what if we just got so vulnerable before the Lord that we had no reservations, that we had nothing that was holding us back from all that God wanted for us in this life? What if, what if, what would our lives look like in the next 30 days, 60 days, 6 months, year, 2 years? What could we accomplish for the kingdom well I believe it starts with just simply turning from whatever direction it is maybe it's fear maybe it's rejection maybe it's some hurt or, or some pain or maybe it's just like I said or an act of disobedience whatever it is that we just make a declaration tonight that whatever it is that's hindering you from all that God has for you today it stops. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you right now, Father, that we are, we declare that we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Holy Spirit, I yield to you tonight. I invite you into my life. I invite you into every room, every closet, everything that you would desire. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me with your power. Fill me with your gifts. Fill me with the fruit, everything that you'd have for me. I won't let another day without a spiritual checkup so I can be everything that you called me to be in this life. In Jesus' name. Can you give the Lord a hand tonight? I believe if you prayed that prayer with all your heart, I believe the Holy Spirit came in and baptized you and filled you overflowing. 
I believe that Luke chapter 24 says that if we would just ask. That if we would just ask. Actually, Luke chapter 11 said, how much more? If your earthly father give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Ghost to those who ask for him? But see, here's the thing. You've got to ask. He's a gentleman. He don't come in rudely and take over. You have to invite him in. Now that he's in your life and now that you prayed that prayer in faith and I believe he came in and and just filled you to overflowing, now just begin to yield to him. And I want to hear from you. Because I believe if you prayed that prayer in faith and you've never asked the Holy Spirit to baptize you and fill you with His presence and power and glory, the Word of God is going to become alive to you. It's not going to be just reading a book anymore. You're going to get revelation. I believe that gifts of the Spirit will begin to operate. You know, I think a lot of times if we we don't realize how the gifts are even operating We don't even realize that the gifts operate all the time without us even being aware because we're so accustomed to having this tagline or this certain way that they function. And the more that I I find that I study the scriptures, I see Jesus flowing in the gifts without saying, thus saith the Lord. Here's a word for you. (laughs) He's just doing things. And for that moment and that time, I challenge you this week, just to begin to yield every day to the Holy Spirit and watch Him set up these divine appointments. Watch Him speak through you and give you things and show you things. Show you things in the future. Show you things from the past. Give you the ability to minister on levels you've never been able to minister. Just simply because you say, Lord, I'm available. It's not about ability. It's about availability. Can I tell you, he hasn't had anyone qualified working for him yet. He never has. Just read the Bible. Look at some of the people he used. (laughs) As we were going to get into the word tonight, look at Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. Why? Because he qualifies those he calls. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your presence, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we love your presence. We need your presence. Help us, Holy Spirit, to leave here today with our hearts and minds vulnerable before you, God. That we would just become fanatical about your presence. That your presence would be the only thing that drives us. It would be the very thing that wakes us up and puts us to bed, Lord. Help us. Help us this week, the end of this week, Lord. Lead us to the people that you would want us to minister to, God. That People who need a miracle, Lord. People who need a word. People who need... <laughs> they need you, Jesus. Help us to see every situation in our life that you've ordained and put together and lined up, God, that we, that we may be vessels, Lord, that, that we may really become the hands and feet. And so, Father, I thank you for these things. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, well, won't you give him one more hand?